Welcome to AP Physics C Mechanics Live Review. I'm Julie Hood, physics teacher at MAST Academy in Miami. And what we're going to learn today, it's a good time. It's all about rotational dynamics, energy, and angular momentum, one of several of my favorite topics. So we're definitely going to continue looking at the analogy between fixed axis rotation and linear translation for objects subject to torques. We're going to look at physical systems that have rotational inertia. And we're going to apply the conservation of energy principles to systems such as rolling bodies on inclines. And we'll also look at the law of conservation of angular momentum. We're going to look at several multiple choice questions from previously um, released exams, as well as some free response questions. And you too can find these and more if you simply Google AP Central Physics C Mechanics. And if you even add free response, you're going to go right to the page that takes you back to exams uh, all the way to 1999, along with their scoring rubrics. And you can, you can learn so much going through the old exams and seeing what uh, the College Board is looking for in order for you to get those points so you can get your five. I know you want a five. That's why you're here at the review. So why don't we get started? First, we'll do a little review. Newton's two second laws. I'm sure you're familiar uh, with F equals MA. If there's a net force acting on a mass, it accelerates. Well, it turns out Newton's second law has to do with rotational motion. If there's a net torque that acts on a mass distribution, that's the I there, the moment of inertia, then that mass will angularly accelerate. And I mentioned I, the moment of inertia, and it's simply the sum of every piece of mass in the object that you're applying the torque to at its respective distance from the axis of rotation squared. We will definitely have some practice um, calculating moments of inertia today. So here's how the moment of, of inertia um, affects rolling objects. Um, I mentioned there's two ways to calculate the moment of inertia. If I haven't, I'll tell you right now. You can use the parallel axis theorem. If you're not um, if you're not, your axis rotation is not through the center of mass, but rather a distance d away from that center of mass, you can simply use this parallel axis theorem to calculate the new moment of inertia of your system. Or, real fun, you can use integral calculus. Because after all, the sum of all the little mass elements at their respective distance squared is the integral of r squared dm. And we will do that today, too. Um, we'll also look at the conservation of energy applied to objects rolling down inclines. And I mentioned angular momentum. Well, you remember linear uh, momentum, P is MV. We talked about that a lot a few days ago. And it's conserved, wonderful. You can change momentum if you add an external force. Well, likewise, you have angular momentum. And the uh, large L represents angular momentum, mass, the uh, rotational analog is the moment of inertia. And for linear velocity, in the angular rotational world, you have the omega, which is angular velocity. And guess what? It's also conserved. But guess what? Again, you can change it. But this time, it requires an external torque to change your angular momentum. So these are the principles behind what we're going to do today. So why don't we just get started by looking at some examples? Okay, here's an 
uh, problem from the 1988 exam. You have a bowling ball that give you the mass and the radius and the moment of inertia. It's a, a solid sphere, so two-fifths mr squared. It's rolling without slipping along a surface at a speed of v, and it encounters an incline, and they want to know how high up vertically that bowling ball will reach. So here's the visual of that. The bowling ball is both translating with a linear speed of v, and it's angular rotating with an angular rotation speed of omega. And we want to know how high it'll get. Well, this is a job for the conservation of, of energy. The energy you have at the bottom will equal the energy you have at the top of where it reaches at the top of the incline, uh, vertical height of H. So um, down below, we had kinetic energy, but remember, there's two kinds. There's kinetic energy tied up in the translational motion and in the rotational motion. And all that kinetic energy will get converted to gravitational potential energy, and that'll help us find H. So here's the translational, there's the rotational, and there's the gravitational um, potential energy, MGH. So we have to make uh, some substitutions. Uh, of course, we were given I, two-fifths mr squared. And here's the nice thing. Omega and V are related by R. The tan, uh, translational velocity V equals R omega. So omega, of course, is V over R. And all of that is going to equal um, our gravitational potential energy. Well, I have to add these two together. Yes, um, the R's go away. And I know how to deal with one half plus one fifth. I find a common denominator, which is 10. So there's seven tenths mv squared equals mgh. And no surprise, the masses also go away. And when I solve finally for how high it will get, I find that it goes. Answer D, 7 tenths V squared over G. So try this yourself. And uh, oh, here's something a little trickier because they don't give you the moment of inertia of this object. We've got a sphere, mass M, radius R, and rotational inertia I. And we want to know what the speed of the center of mass will be when it gets to the bottom of the incline. OK, slow down and read the whole question. If the plane is frictionless, that's key. So sure, energy is conserved, but this object will not rotate. If there's no friction, then there's no friction force to cause a torque to make this sphere roll. So all of, you might as well have a block of ice sliding down the hill without friction. Um, you're gonna have potential energy at the top there and it'll all get converted to translational kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared. And you get a result that you have seen before. A is your answer. Now. You know, don't be bothered if they give you more information than you need. It's okay. They told you what the rotational inertia is. They even gave you the mass and the radius, and none of it mattered. It was all about the gravitational acceleration and how high you were up the incline vertically. Okay, so there's another part to this question, and it's a little more interesting because now you do have friction. So the sphere rolls without slipping, and they want you to find the velocity at the bottom. So we'll still use conservation of energy, but now additionally, we have rotational kinetic energy, which is one half I omega squared. Remember, omega is V over R. So you do that substitution and you try to clean things up. I don't like fractions, so I multiplied everything by two, and I'm trying to solve for V, and it looks like I have two terms on the right-hand side that have a V squared in them, and when I do the algebra, E is the answer. 
You can try that at home and make sure you get the same answer. Now we've got a ring and a disc, and they're down at the bottom of this incline, and they're both moving with the same um, velocity towards the incline. And they want to know which of these, if there is a difference, which of these will move up um, further um, up the incline. And it, it, the way to approach this problem is, yes, think about the conservation of energy. But here's the deal. At the bottom, um, if they're both going the same speed, there's a lot of energy tied up in rotating the ring because the ring has more moment of inertia than the solid disk. So that's why the ring is going to get further up the hill. Now it's true if they both start side by side at the same vertical height and you let them go, the disk will win. But principles applying, um, the disk will have less moment of inertia and so it won't use as much energy rolling down the hill. And that's why the disc would win. Whereas here, the ring has more energy at the bottom of the hill and it'll get up there uh, much further than the disc. Now we've got um, two connected masses and they're passing over a true pulley where there's friction in the pulley and that little round um, disc pulley is going to rotate. So they're asking us to pick which equation will describe the pulley's rotational motion. So in terms of the pulley, the system, the two blocks will accelerate at an, a rate A, the pulley will angularly accelerate at a rate alpha. So the reason it's accelerating is the tensions in the string on either side of the pulley are different. And tension two is going to be greater. Uh, that's why the system is rotating um, clockwise. And the way to set this up is to think of the net torque being I alpha. And the net torque is the two, tensional forces at their respective radius are. So the equation that describes the pulley's rotational motion is uh, choice D. I've simply taken my equation and I've um, pulled the R out and there we go. So now we've got a cylinder rotating with a constant angular acceleration about a fixed axis. And they give us the cylinder's moment of inertia. And at time equals zero, the cylinder's at rest. And after two seconds, um, it reaches an angular velocity of one radian per second. And they want us to find the angular acceleration. This is a three-part question. Um, the first one is actually very straightforward. We have to remember, well, what is angular acceleration? It's the change in angular velocity. And we're given um, that the, uh, the cylinder starts at rest. And after two seconds, that's the time, we're told the angular velocity is one radian per second. When you substitute those values in, you find that the angular acceleration is a half of a radian per second squared, which is choice A. Then we want to find the angular momentum of the cylinder at time equals two. This is angular momentum, I omega. We're given I, we're given omega after two seconds. You literally just substitute the values in and you find that D is your answer. And this last one asks how much kinetic energy the cylinder will have at two seconds. Um, OK, the rotational kinetic energy is 1 half I omega squared. There's I. There's omega. Plug it in, and you get 2 kilogram meter squared per second squared. Well, that's equivalent to a joule. So that's why we have two joules of energy. 
Now, I put three different problems up here from different years. And I want to tell you right now, they're all the same thing. Uh, we're talking about an ice skater. Sometimes we call the ice skater a figure skater. Um, but basically, the ice skater goes into a spin and the vertical axis um, through the core of the skater's body, that's the axis of rotation. And the arms are initially extended outward. Here we say arms are fully extended. Here we say arms fully extended horizontally. And here we say the arms are fully extended. All the same thing, right? So then the skater drops their arms to their side and they want to know what happens to the angular momentum and the kinetic energy of the skater. Okay, so remember linear momentum, MV. Here's angular momentum, I omega, and it's conserved. Angular momentum is conserved. That's key here. So right away, I just put X's through all the choices that cannot be correct. Anywhere they, uh, that where there's a choice of the angular momentum changing, increasing or decreasing, throw it away. That cannot be your answer. Now, you've at least narrowed this down to three or even two choices, which is great. But if you want to get the right answer, now we have to do some physics. So here we go. Um, angular momentum is I omega. What it was initially has to be what it is after the arms are dropped. Here's the ice skater rotating at a rate of omega I with the arms out. Then she drops her arms and she has another velocity. Is it greater or is it less or is it the same? Well, because her arms are being dropped, all those, that mass in her arms is now closer to the vertical axis of rotation. So initially, the moment of inertia was considerably greater than it is after her arms drop. And what that means is her angular velocity will increase after her arms drop. And since kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, is um, related to the speed, that means the final kinetic energy is going to increase. So you just find where it says increase, and those are your answers. These have showed up year after year. It's been a while. Maybe you'll see an ice skater problem again this year, or something like it. So now we have a disk sliding on a horizontal surface, negligible friction, and it collides with a rod that's free to move. Okay, and the rod can move and rotate. And we want to know which of the following quantities must be the same before and after the collision. Well, the linear momentum is always conserved. The angular momentum is always conserved. Usually when there's a collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. Unless it says it's a perfectly elastic collision, do not assume kinetic energy is conserved. And that's why C is your answer here. Now we have um, uh, an old problem from the ACORN, uh, the old uh, curriculum and exam description booklet, very small. They offered a few multiple choice questions, and this was one of them. You had two disks, and X was spinning uh, at an angular rate of omega, and the disks are identical, and suddenly disk Y drops onto disk X, and I guess there's Velcro involved because they stick together, and now the, the system rotates together, and they want to know which of the following is half of what it was before. Well, you've got rotation, and you have a collision of Y with X, so you should think of the conservation of angular momentum. Initial and final have to be the same. And But what we're doing is we're doubling the mass. And so we're doubling the moment of inertia, which means that the angular speed has to be cut in half. And that's why C 
is your answer. So why don't we practice with some uh, free response problems. Here we have an object rolling down an incline. This happens to be a solid sphere. So it's rotational inertia is two fifths MR squared. There are no numbers in this problem. You have to express all your solutions in terms of the mass, the radius, the height, and um, the incline angle and physical constants. When they say physical constants, they're talking about little g, the acceleration due to gravity, or even big G if you're um, doing gravitation problems. So the first part of this problem asks you to draw the free body diagram. OK, let's see. It's uh, there's always going. We're on. Uh, apparently, we're on the Earth. We're in a gravitational field. So there's a gravitational force. And because we're on an incline, we know there's a normal force. Whatever weight the incline feels, it has to support that weight with this normal force. Now, this is not a traditional free body diagram where everything starts from a point. This is an extended mass. So you have to start your force vectors from where they start. And the normal force is where the point of contact is between the sphere and the incline. The gravitational force starts at the center of mass. And the frictional force is needed to get this object to roll. And it um, is also at the point of contact. And of course, it would point up the incline. So there is your free body diagram. And we'll use that throughout the problem to um, calculate what they ask us to calculate. Um, the first thing is we need to find the translational speed of the sphere when it reaches the bottom of the incline. This, in fact, is a job for the conservation of energy. So we've got gravitational potential energy, and it's being converted into both translational and rotational kinetic energy. And our moment of inertia for this object, the solid sphere is 2 fifths mr squared. That was given. And we know omega and v are related by r. Omega is v over r. So when we simplify all that, we end up having to add 1 half and 1 fifth. We did that earlier um, with a multiple choice problem. The masses went away, and we got 7 tenths v squared equal gh. And we're looking to solve for v. And that's why we get the square root of 10 sevenths gravity times height. Now, I put a little ss there for solid sphere. We're going to look at some other objects. See, now they're saying we're going to replace the solid sphere with a hollow sphere. And the hollow sphere has a greater moment of inertia because all of its mass is out at the rim. So we're going to release it from the same location as we did the solid sphere. And they want to know when this, the hollow sphere gets to the bottom, is the translational speed going to be greater than, less than, or equal to that of the solid sphere? Well, here's the deal. It's going to be less. Why? Of course, they want you to justify your answer. Don't just guess. This isn't multiple choice. Um, so uh, a justification could be that the hollow sphere has a greater moment of inertia than the solid sphere. And therefore, the hollow sphere requires more rotational energy to get it to roll down the hill than that of the solid sphere, leaving less um, Kinet, translational kinetic energy um, when the hollow sphere gets to the bottom, and therefore the hollow sphere will lag behind the solid sphere. And that's why we picked less than. Now, notice I didn't use any words. I wrote equations. And I assure you, an equation is worth a 1,000 words. If you can um, keep things succinct and terse, um, use some equations or refer to graphs if needed. You don't have to write a 10-page report, not in physics. 
Now here's a little um, side note of mine. Uh, a solid sphere, if we look at the moment of inertia of each of these objects, I simply put a C as um, the coefficient out front of the MR squared. And they all have a different C and the ring you see is the biggest and the solid sphere is the smallest. And that means really, um, if you calculated the velocity at the bottom for each of these, the solid sphere has the highest velocity. The ring would totally lose the race. And I leave this as an exercise for you, I'm leaving you a little homework today. Make sure you get the same results. Now we're gonna determine the linear acceleration of the solid sphere when it reaches the bottom of the inclined plane. Solid sphere, that was the velocity when it reached the bottom. So what we have going on, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and square that velocity. You'll see why I did that in a moment. Um, this is the equation we're gonna use, straight up um, kinematics. And the L there is the distance down the inclined plane. Now we weren't given L, we were given H and theta. So we need to put L in terms of H and theta and there it is, H over sine theta. So Katoa, it still works. So solving for A and the fact that the solid sphere started at rest, we find that the acceleration is 5 sevenths G sine theta. Good, now let's go ahead and compare that with our four different objects. Um, our acceleration for the solid sphere is the greatest, just like the velocity was. And we would expect that. And again, you can try this at home and see if you get the same results for acceleration. Compare them with velocity. We would expect if we're gonna have the greatest velocity, we would have the greatest acceleration. And likewise, the least velocity corresponds with the least acceleration. That would be the ring. Now we're gonna find the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the sphere. Okay, so here's, this was the acceleration and we're gonna use um, Newton's second law. We're looking for force. So Newton's second law should ring a bell. We've got the component of the weight mg along the plane, mg sine theta, pulling this solid sphere down, but friction is slowing down that motion and um, ultimately resulting in the mass of that sphere accelerating. And we already found the acceleration, so we can um, find the frictional force. It's two sevenths mg sine theta. Make sure your units work out. mg, that's like, oh, ma, that's a force. Good. Don't forget, you know, sometimes that mass disappears and you no longer have a force. Okay, so here's uh, back to my favorite little picture today. If we're looking at frictional forces, the solid sphere has the least. That's why it got down there first. It had the greatest velocity. It had the greatest deceleration. Poor ring always loses the race. Now we wanna find the minimum coefficient between the sphere and the inclined plane that's required so that the sphere rolls without slipping. So again, there's the acceleration. This is a job for Newton's law. We set this up, uh, the equation up before, but now we have to look at what this frictional force is. It's mu times the normal. And the normal force is the weight that the incline feels. So it's going to be the component of the weight that's perpendicular to the incline. So mg cosine theta with a mu out front that gives us the frictional force. Substitute it all in, the masses go away. Isn't that sweet? So, do, uh, so does gravity. In fact, we end up with a result that's simply dependent on the angle of the incline. You could go to the moon where gravity's different and you're going to get the same result. Um, the mu, the coefficient of friction is only dependent on the material properties that are in contact, not with the mass, not with um, the gravitational field that the objects are sli sliding and rolling in. 
So there's mu and uh, mu for the solid sphere is less than the ring because the frictional force was less. Try it at home and look, all those coefficients are the same. Very nice. And they're all sine for friction and tangent for mu. Interesting. Okay, so what if we um, made mu less than the value determined in part seven? So now the sphere rotates and slips. And we want to know at the bottom of the incline whether the translational speed would be greater than, less than, or equal than that calculated in part B. Well, I say greater, and the reason is there's less energy transferred to the rotational motion. So more energy from the gravitational potential can go into translating the object down the incline, and that's why it'll go faster at the bottom if there's some slipping and not just all rotating. So why don't we look at another practice problem? This time we have a bar of mass M length L pivoted at the one end, and we're going to let it fall. And we have to derive an expression uh, both for the moment of inertia using integral calculus and also for the velocity of the free end at point B when the rod is in the vertical position. And then we're going to do an experiment and try to verify that uh, equation that we derive and ultimately um, find an experimental value for the acceleration due to gravity. So here's our uniform rod, and we need to use integral calculus to find the rotational inertia of the rod about what uh, one of its in. And what they're, what's nice is they give you the answer. They want you to show that, but it, they give you the answer. So even if you get stuck in part A, you have the moment of inertia to do the rest of your problem. Now, this is the definition of the moment of inertia. I have to sum up every little mass element at its respective um, distance from the pivot point squared. This is a job for calculus. dm is each little mass element at its respective distance squared. The, the, the key here is to see that we have a uniform rod and density is going to be the mass over the rod times the length of the rod. So that's dm over the little thickness of that dm mass dr. And when we um, make the substitution of dm into our integral, then we get this, r squared times rho dr. Now, now we've got a variable r and an integration with respect to r. And we're going to integrate from the pivot point all the way to length l. And when we do the integration of r squared, we get r cubed over 3. And when we evaluate it at the limits, we get rho l cubed over 3. Well, we're not there yet. We need m l squared over 3. Oh, that's because rho l, we'll use one of those L cubes to um, combine with the rho, and that's the mass. So now we, that's how we showed um, that the rotational inertia of the rod pivoted at the end is ml squared over 3. Let's make sure we get the same results using the parallel axis theorem. There's our parallel axis theorem. If we pivoted it through the center of mass, um, I know it's 1 12th ml squared. And I just need to add the entire mass uh, times the distance from the center of mass to the new pivot point, which is half of the length. And when I do um, the algebra, 1 12th and 1 4th is 1 3rd. I'm always pleased when we get the same answer. So now we're going to let the, the bar fall from its horizontal position, and we're going to find the velocity when it reaches position B, when the bar is vertical. So uh, let's do that. Let's derive an expression for velocity. We're going to use the conservation of energy. Uh, the energy at E better equal the energy at B. Yeah, but A, um, did I say E? The energy at A is all 
gravitational potential. And the energy at uh, when the bar is in the vertical position is all rotational kinetic. Now, MGH equals one half I omega squared. What is H? The key here is to follow the center of mass of the bar. See that X when the bar is in its horizontal position? The X will drop to this position when the bar is in the vertical position. And that means it's fallen H, which is L over two. So you need to make that substitution. Now, uh, also, we already found the moment of inertia was one third ML squared. And there we go. Omega is V over L. And when we do the algebra, we find that the velocity when it's at point B is the square root of 3GL. Excellent. Now let's do an experiment. Uh, we set up an experiment with rods of different length, and we used um, photo gates to measure the velocity of the free end when it passed through position B. And um, this was the velocity we expected. In the table there, that's the data we got. Now, they want you to linearize this data. I look at V and I look at square root of 3GL. And if I plotted that, I would get, uh, I don't know, something kind of parabolic. And I, I wouldn't know how to determine G from that. So I'm going to turn my equation into a straight line. I'm going, and then I'm going to linearize the data. This is a great technique. I'm sure you've seen it. You'll certainly see it on your exam. When I see um, straight line, I think a Y equals MX plus B. And here, my Y, my vertical axis is V. My X is the square root of L. And my slope is the square root of 3G. So if I could just linearize my data, and I can, if I make my vertical axis V and my horizontal axis the square root of L. Now, um, now it would be linearized if I did that. And they want you to use the remaining rows as needed to record quantities you indicated. OK, so we need to um, take the length data and um, take the square root of each value. Don't forget units and don't feel the need to fill out all the rows. We only need one row for this particular linearization. So after I take the square root of each length value, here's what I get. Now the next part of the data, remember we're gonna use this linearized data to find G. So we're gonna plot the, um, the line, uh, the straight line data points on this grid. These were the straight line data points. And the first thing we need to do is label the axes. Don't forget the units. And then we need to inspect how to best scale this. Now, the length is pretty straightforward. Velocity, not so much. We don't need to go all the way to the um, velocity equals zero. Um, we could start at two. We, you want to use at least a third of the graph given. You don't want to scale it inappropriately so all your data is in one little part of uh, the grid. So when I plot my data, oh, there it is. Beautiful. I'm using plenty of the graph given, and it looks fairly linear. I pull out a straight edge, and I um, just be draw best fit line. Now, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to use the slope of that line to determine G. Don't use the data points. Find two points on your best fit line. Here's one, and that happens to be at 0.45 uh, for the square root of L and uh, 2.5 for velocity. Here's another point at 1.3, 6.70. So now let's use that, those two points we chose to find the slope. And from the slope, we'll find G. These were our points. This was our equation. So our slope is going to be the change in velocity over the change in the square root of L. Using our data points, we get this value. And remember, that has to be the square root of 3G. So solving for G, 
we get the slope squared that we determined from the line divided by three. And when we square that slope and divide by three, we get 8.1 meters per second squared, which isn't terrible. This is physics after all. It's, if it works, you probably did something wrong. Um, I like to say within 10% is, is fine. This is more than 10%. Hmm, what's going on? Well, we certainly don't want G greater than 9.8 or 10. That would be kind of not reasonable at all. Um, but the problem asks us to describe two ways in which the effects of air resistance um, could be reduced. Well, there's a lot of ways. You could certainly do the experiment in a vacuum. That's everybody's favorite. But honestly, who's got a vacuum chamber that big? But maybe you do. Um, you could use shorter length rods. That would decrease the error. Um, probably a really good way to do it is use more massive or denser rods. So ask your teacher for a vacuum chamber and a set of rods made out of titanium. I'm sure your physics teacher has um, an infinite budget. And of course, you could use a more aerodynamic shape instead of something um, square or rectangular in cross section, use something circular in cross section. Uh, so you could reduce air resistance that way. So what should we take away from this? Well, we saw that we used energy conservation a lot to solve uh, rotational motion uh, problems. And rotational kinetic energy came up a lot. I'm sure you're more comfortable with translational 1 half mv squared, but rotational kinetic energy is a big key player when you do rotational problems. And the moment of inertia is some factor, some coefficient times the mass of the object and the radius of the object squared. Now you you know, might not have um, a circular or spherical object. So the R represents where the, a piece of mass is located. And remember, we did this nice summary for several different classic shapes uh, and moments of inertia and the coefficient of each of the solid sphere, solid disk, hollow sphere ring, I've put an order of, of magnitude and that definitely affected the velocities and accelerations and the frictional force and coefficients of friction. So um, go back and try this at home. I'm giving you homework. I'm gonna definitely check up on you. Um, other things to take away. Newton's law, always my favorite. If there's a net force, then the mass accelerates. When there's rotation, don't forget, there's also net torque giving rise to angular acceleration. And that moment of inertia, once again, mi, ri squared, sum through all the uh, little masses at their respective distance squared. And we saw two ways to calculate the moment of inertia. We could use the parallel axis theorem. We also um, used integral calculus. We also saw that, uh, of course, linear momentum is conserved, but we saw that angular momentum is also conserved. Very, very powerful conservation laws. So I want you to go back to the old exams that you can get on the AP Central site and check out the scoring rubrics and work through as many as you can. You're gonna be a pro by game day and you're gonna get a five. I also suggest you um, check out the AP daily videos uh, in your AP classroom and unit five, the um, videos by Ms. Jensfold are fantastic and can give you a great foundation. Um, so why don't you come back tomorrow and you'll have Miss Jen's fold reviewing gravitation. I want to thank you for coming today. It was great having you.